the opportunity um, uh, and um, today I would like to talk to you about um, uh, 200x faster uh, olfactory learning algorithm using actors uh, instead of uh, spiking neural uh, networks. Um, so he, here is a brief agenda. Uh, I'll, I'll go to the presentation mode. Here is a brief agenda. And before this agenda, I would like to mention that uh, this work uh, is um, is purely my work, which was done in my free time, a and um, it does not reflect the uh, work of uh, Intel Corporation, who is my employer. Uh, this is purely uh, work. Uh, all the all the all the um, and the main algorithms which I present were actually done uh, during my free time, um, and not uh, and and Intel does not bear any responsibility for this. It is purely my responsibility. I, and after the um, after the initial disclaimer, uh, here is today's agenda. Uh, first, we'll discuss about the pros and cons of spiking neural networks. And then uh, we'll discuss about uh, what olfactory learning is and, and show how uh, olfactory learning can be done using spiking neural networks. And then we can how we can implement the same algorithm using actors and, and how it can be better. And, and also uh, think about um, future outlook and future research opportunities. Uh, so uh, usually uh, for spiking neural networks, uh, abbreviated as, as SNNs, uh, the usual chain of uh, flow of arguments is um, the brain is an existence proof of robust general intelligence, and it is very super energy efficient and has massive parallelism, uh, and the brain uses spiking neural networks. And, uh, and, and we also observe that deep learning has many limitations, like it needs huge training sets, uh, it is very brittle and narrow. It, it needs a lot of computational resources as shown in this graph below. Uh, uh, and there's a lot of energy consumption because of this huge computational resources. Uh, so in the, in the graph, we can see that um, as the deep learning models become get bigger and bigger, uh, the number of days uh, spent with, while calculating at one petaflop per second is almost uh, reaching like 100 days with all these big models for the training. So this is uh, extremely uh, computationally intensive. And, um, but the brain is very extremely energy efficient. We do all the things we do with just a, at a budget of a 20 watt power budget. Uh, so the, the usual argument is uh, spiking neural networks could be a great alternative and neuromorphic computing might be a great alternative. So that is the sales pitch uh, of the uh, SNN pro proponents. Um, and and they make great points because brain we, just, we can learn a lot of things from the brain, and and, uh, and also there are opponents, right? Like just like how spiking neural networks, uh, their proponents, they're also opponents or skeptics. Uh, a simple thought experiment to motivate the skeptics is uh, uh, here uh, uh, showing all the lists of all. Uh, it's a thought experiment. Um, basically, if you if you list all the alien species of our universe with similar intelligence. Uh, on the x-axis, and on the y-axis is the energy delay product, which uh, circuit designers care about. It is basically the energy required to solve a problem uh, multiplied by the time to so time to solve the problem. And if we just hypothetical graph, where, hum where we have human Captain Kirk here, and Captain uh, Spock, and other alien species in Star Trek, um, uh, the, the question is, um, uh, only one of the alien species could be having really good energy delay product. And the question is, does this alien also use uh, spiking neurons? It's a simple thought experiment, right? Uh, because if you use a purely computation, uh, computational lens, um, say uh, we want to implement a, something like flying, flying, which is the algorithm, the computation of the, the high level goal we want to implement. And the algorithm is like flapping wings. Uh, and we use the feathers, which is the physical implementation. This, this is the mass three levels of hierarchy, like computation, algorithm, and implementation. Uh, we can use this. Uh, we can also do it differently. Like we can you know, jet plane uh, achieves the same flying, uh, but it has a different uh, cost profile. It has its own trade-offs. We can also do have a, a quadcopter, right? So if we, if you think that intelligence uh, can be purely achieved by computationalism, uh, then it's a, it's an interesting question to ask a thought experiment to ask like uh, is spiking neural networks the most optimal way or can we do better than spiking neural networks 
Pam C, can I ask yeah. what, on the on the vertical axis when you have energy delay product? What what, what does that mean? Does it mean uh, energy consumption or something else? It is both the, the the energy consumed and also the time to solution. How quickly you solve the problem? So delay is here the time to solve the problem, and energy is the uh, the, the energy required to solve the problem. Uh, so the energy delay product is the is the multiplication of these two. I see. I see. Yeah, it's like how energy efficient uh, we are and how quickly we solve the problem. Uh, that is, um, um, and usually people in the circuit design care about this uh, energy delay product. Um, and uh, in a lot of uh, um, neuromorphic publications, they talk about the energy, energy delay product uh, as a measure of efficiency. So, um, this is just a thought experiment, uh, but right now um, we are uh, right now we are focusing only on this region. Uh, I'll quickly use my pen. Yeah, right now we are focusing only on this region, right? The brain is this region, but th there might be other models of computation which could be really uh, uh, efficient, and we don't know about them, right? Right. Uh, you, here you have a, a Spock, Mr. Spock, a little a little above uh, Captain Curtin. Is that on purpose or it was just a uh... It's, it's just arbitrary. I, I didn't know where to put him, so I just put him somewhere. Uh, it's because it's just an arbitrary thought experiment. Uh, but this is just uh, meant to um, make us uh, visualize that there, there could be different energy and delay product costs for uh, different brain, uh, different computing architectures, different AI architectures. Uh, but uh, there's nothing intentional. It's just uh, uh, it's it's just a cartoon kind of uh, picture. Thank you. Oh, thank thank you, John. So the argument there are spike the, the, the spiking neural network skeptics. Uh, there are people who say uh, is spiking neurons the cause of the general intelligence or is it just a correlation because of the evolutionary constraint. Uh, the we, we animals were born with spiking neurons and nature had to evolve intelligence using these spiking neurons. That we don't know. And the neuroscientists, um, they do not have any choice. They have to explain how the brain uses the spiking neural networks. Uh, whereas we humans, uh, as engineers, they have a choice and we need to understand the trade-offs of using any particular, even artificial neural networks or spiking neural networks or any other paradigm. Uh, we need to have some sort of a, um, understanding why we need to use it. And, and also uh, spiking neural networks and artificial neural networks, they're part of the connectionist AI paradigm uh, where, where we have small compute elements which are connected to each other using some weights and we modify the weights. That is the connectionist AI paradigm. But there is the other paradigm uh, like the symbolic AI, which was really popular in the 70s and 80s, but now it's not so popular. Uh, uh, but can we combine, but human beings are capable of symbolic AI as well, right? We write a lot of computer code, which is very symbolic in nature and mathematics. And we are capable of symbolic reasoning. Um, so uh, the usual argument is how can we combine symbolic AI? Can we, can we, shouldn't we focus on high level algorithms instead of low level uh, compute elements? So that is the, the skeptics of uh, spiking neural networks come up with these arguments and the brain is very com complicated, right? There's so many things like uh, we have the, um, ion, the ion channels, uh, proteins, uh, receptors, brain regions, and cell types, and new different uh, synapses, connections, and the whole lot of complications. And we don't know at what level we um, of granularity we need to simulate or not to understand the brain. Uh, so it's a really complicated task. And if you look at it from mass three levels of, uh, um, of compu computation, uh, where basically we focus on uh, the computation of the high level algorithm, or high level function we want to implement at the top and the, the algorithm we want to use in, in between and the biophysical substrate is like a neurons, artificial neurons or neuromorphic computing substrate. Um, so as we go up, it's like constructionism where we are trying to build everything uh, from bottom up and the top-down approach is a reductionist approach uh, where a lot of people in cognitive science use that. And we don't know which, uh, where in this particular, uh, uh, in this uh, top-down approach, where where in this region is the best sweet spot? We don't know. We are st still exploring. Uh, for example, uh, for the for the spiking neurons, uh, for the individual neurons, say if, how they produce action potentials, 
uh, we use this all sorts of equations like Hodgkin's equation and things like that to explain how the action potentials change. Uh, but internally, uh, there are a lot of sodium and potassium cannons, there's a lot of physics, there's a lot of chemistry going on. And at the high level, but what is all we trying to do uh, with all these neural codes and everything? And the same with uh, synapses. Uh, we do a lot of um, synaptic modification to we learn a lot of things. Uh, and we use principles like Hebb's principle at, a, at, a, at the algorithm level. And at a very low level, we have these molecular receptors, NMDA receptors, and things like that. Uh, but at what level of abstraction is the right level of abstraction um, for um, building artificial intelligence applications is still not known to us. We are experimenting, and so um, that this is the uh, this is the this this is the the the, the top down the reduction uh, reductionist versus the bottom up constructionist approach. This is the co conflict between these two. Like um, that, that that is the main focus of my talk. Uh, and even if we talk about um, energy efficiency of the brain, people say the brain is really energy efficient. Uh, but this paper shows that the communication in the brain is 35 times more uh, more expensive than the, just the computation. And even the, the very computation uh, of the brain is the bits per joule uh, for the brain, for, the, for an individual neuron, uh, is 10 to the 8 times that of the theoretical minimum, the Landau, the Landau's limit. Uh, so. The brain um, is really energy efficient compared to many of the devices we know, but it is still possible to go better than the do better than the brain. Uh, so theoretically possible to do better than the brain, and our um, and the scientific community is always looking for ways to improve the energy efficiency. And likewise, uh, people say a lot of uh, people say there's a lot of massive parallelism uh, in the, all these neural net, neural networks. Uh, but this paper published in Nature Physics shows that. Um, um, even though there's a lot of low-level fine-grained parallelism, it doesn't always translate into high-level task-level parallelism. So, for example, uh, sometimes driving while listening to the radio is very simple, but driving while uh, texting is not simple. That's why it's dangerous. And driving while uh, playing a video game in your smartphone is extremely dangerous uh, because we cannot do both of them concurrently. Uh, so even though brain has a lot of parallelism, uh, so it is not always do we have this uh, task level, high level parallelism. Uh, sometimes if there's a shared representation, uh, the number of uh, parallel and tasks which the network can do uh, grows sublinearly. Uh, so um, there's a trade-off. It's not as if uh, just because we have a whole bunch of massive parallel neurons and synapses, everything, we have a high level parallelism. So these are some arguments from the skeptics of the spiking neural network uh, paradigm. And these are all pros, good pros and cons. And this is a very active area of research. And I, 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 and I came to learn that uh, your research team is looking into all these uh, topics. And, and with um, the deep uh, understanding of mathematics, I believe that you are the right team uh, because you have much more deeper understanding because I'm just a, a software and electrical engineer. Um, but you have a much, much deeper understanding. And I believe, uh, uh, your team is well positioned to uh, do further research uh, into these topics. Um, so the, the main crux of my the talk is the, what the constructionism versus the reductionism. Uh, like spiking neural networks is a very constructionist bottom-up approach inspired by brain neuroscience, but actors is a very reductionist approach, which is a top-down from which is inspired from um, um, symbolic AI and software engineering. Um, and actors is very popular in software engineering. But interestingly, uh, the people in software engineering and people in neuroscience, they don't talk to each other. So that's why it's not so popular. Uh, so, uh, but my intention is to popularize this, this paradigm. Uh, it's just one alternative. I'm not saying that this is the um, only way. This is just one, one more alternative which we can pursue and compare with other, other techniques and to see how we can uh, produce uh, um, intelligent algorithms. So. Um, coming to this, um, like this reductionist constructionist versus reductionist uh, approach, uh, right now we have been very abstract and very high level, uh, but uh, we want to take a, a specific use case. Uh, so usually um, uh, the olfactory learning is a very good uh, example uh, because uh, olfactory learning deals with the sense of smell and it is a very deep research topic in neuroscience, like how uh, say um, animals and humans, 
how we learn to sm how we learn the smells uh, in an environment which is completely occluded with a lot of noise. And in future, if we are presented with the same smell, how we can quickly recall. And this is a very huge research topic in neuroscience. And I'm not at all an expert on this, but I came to learn know about this algorithm while uh, working in the Intel Neuromorphic Computing Lab. Uh, then, and um, the, the scientists, the algorithms experts were doing a lot of research in this uh, particular field, and they were approaching it from a spiky neural network perspective. Uh, but whereas I was looking at, at it from the uh, a, a software and a hardware engineer perspective, and I was looking at it from a completely different perspective. Uh, and uh, uh, this paper um, was published in Nature Machine Intelligence. This is a rapid online learning um, and robust recall in neuromorphic olfactory circuit uh, with Professor Tom Clearand of, uh, of Cornell. And Nabil Imam was at that time working at uh, Intel, but now I think he's at with Georgia Tech, uh, but I'm not sure. Uh, so um, this one, it, it was much better than all the deep learning approaches like uh, uh, deep auto encoder and things like that. It was very more efficient because this is a very single shot learning algorithm. And then because of the on-chip uh, spike timing dependent plasticity, plasticity STDP learning um, in, in the neuromorphic chips, uh, it was very extremely energy efficient and it was a great use case about why uh, we need to use spiking neural networks. Uh, so this was um, because of a lot of bottom-up research from Professor Thomas Cleland in his research lab, where they um, studied the, the neurobiology and created a high-level computational mathematical model of what they studied in, after decades of research. And they used all sorts of things uh, and, and with biological experiments, sending electrical signals through mice and uh, studying the molecular uh, uh, three-dimensional fluorescent molecules in the brain and a whole lot of things and they came up, they, they built a computer model, uh, a high level computer model of what the brain, the olfactory bulb in the brain could be doing. Uh, and uh, from the, just like how the math uh, hierarchy of an analysis levels, uh, th this was a very bottom up approach. Um, and they came up with the algorithm using spiking neural networks to explain, uh, to reproduce what is being ex explained, uh, what is being observed in the brain and they say the algorithm it sheds a light on how the brain works. And when you apply it to a computer chip, it rapidly learns uh, patterns better than existing machine learning models. Uh, that was the claim made. Uh, and then uh, the, the, then uh, it was, uh, the, gen the conclusion was uh, spikes and spike timing dependent uh, learning and spike timing coding is very important. Uh, and a thin and neuromorphic approach is better than deep learning. Um, and, and then uh, one line with computers like uh, CPUs and GPUs are not really good at this kind of computations. They're not really designed for that. Um, but then I, I got a question as because I'm a software and hardware engineer, right? So I asked, oh, why, why not? Like, because uh, digital computers, uh, digital logic uh, is, is much more than just one Neumann. One Neumann is one class of art, one computing architectures, but we can build the digital computers using FPGAs and we can do uh, ASICs. Uh, as application specific integrated circuits. So I was I was a, a, a bit skeptical and, and um, I thought, why can't we just do this uh, um, differently? Um, is spiking neural network the only approach to implement this algorithm? So in my free time, I worked on this algorithm. Um, so a long story short, so uh, if we look at the, the main result in the nature paper uh, using SNN based olfactory learning, um, um, this is the main result. Uh, the, the, the important curve we need to look at is the blue curve, uh, which shows um, on the x-axis is the amount of noise we add, uh, all the way from zero noise to 100% noise as we go um, move towards the right. And the y-axis is the training, uh, sorry, the, the inference accuracy. Uh, when we learn some uh, orders and how we test it, what is the accuracy? And this is the curve that was obtained in the Nature paper using spiking neural networks. And this requires uh, 200 times of, of um, message passing between neurons. And, and then we change this uh, uh, the synapse weights using the spike timing dependent plasticity learning rules, which is inspired by neuroscience. And on, on the right side is uh, my, my implementation using actors. Uh, it has a similar, uh, qualitatively very similar. And it approaches this, it solves the same problem using just uh, 
uh, one time step of message passing between all these actors. Uh, and uh, this is the key uh, re result. Um, and I put the code on this GitHub. Uh, here, anybody can download it and uh, they can uh, try and uh, test it out. Uh, and the interesting thing is you can implement the same algorithm like on a sequential computer with I dot Python sequential Python code, or you can or you can parallelize it using it multi-threading or actors or other concurrency parent software concurrency paradigms. And a hardware you can implement on a non one diamond machine like CPU, or you can implement it in FPGA, or you can create a completely different architecture, which is like brain inspired or bio inspired um, a parallel architecture. So there's a lot of flexibility here. Uh, so uh, this goes to show that um, there are different ways to solve the same problem. Uh, and uh, my uh, request to all the scientists uh, and the grad students in your team is to uh, use your deep mathematical knowledge uh, to pursue, to look into this problem, the various problems uh, from neuroscience or machine learning uh, and, uh, and take this uh, research ideas further uh, because I'm, I don't have the mathematics background, deep mathematics background to analyze this kind of uh, various systems, but your team is very well equipped to do that kind of research. Hey, Vansi, um, this is Adar from Brown. Can I ask a question, please? Yes, please, please go ahead. Uh, can you please clarify what do you mean by the time steps here? Because like the, are they the time steps used for the uh, spiking train in the brain or are these like the input signals that have been fed um, to the SNN? Yes, so, so the spiking time steps is um, they, any take any take you take you take a digital neuromorphic machine. Uh, you have the, the every spiking neuron has these uh, differential equations, uh, the couple differential equations which describe the how the states of the, the current and the voltage of the uh, spiking neuron changes. This, this is a continuous system, but when but you have to discretize it when you're Im implemented on a on a disk uh, on a digital uh, chip. So you discretize the time steps, right? Uh, delta T, uh, where you simulate these um, the, the equations of the spiking neuron, and, and in a lot of digital neuromorphic architectures, you have the, the notion of an algorithmic time step. Uh, so every time step, uh, the neurons um, do something, and they send spikes, and they receive this current from synapses, and then the next time step, you update the values of the current, uh, you decay the current and voltage, and, and then update the new value new value of the current and voltage and things like that. So uh, this is the notion of a time step. Um, you know, and a lot of uh, uh, discrete time uh, algorithms have this notion of a time step. Uh, and th 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 this is where this time step comes from. And even like if you, a digital neuromorphic system, uh, you, you simulate a time step and you implement it in hardware. And then you make sure that all the neurons uh, in the various different cores of the new, uh, neuromorphic chip, they uh, implement that particular time step uh, update, and you make sure that there's they're all synchronized, and then move on to the next time step. Right. So, so this is basically the like brain time, the the uh, spike train, how many time step it has. So, in your case, in the um, actuators, right, one time step means that you are following like the conservative deep learning regime when you have a single snapshot and you don't have a set of time steps. Uh, so okay. you, basically, so, so so assuming that you did spike and code the data, yeah. how, how is it possible? Uh, yes, I will explain it to you because oh, this, is, yeah. this is the message passing. Uh, so because the spikes are just binary signals, but in the actors, they, they do integer valued message passing where you can send a, uh, any integer valued message, say within a certain range, say if, if you use an eight bit message, uh, you can send in any any eight bit value as a message. Uh, so uh, and, uh, and and when I explain it using an example, I think that's when it'll get it'll become clear. Because right now it's Perfect. very it's it's very high level and very abstract. Uh, but this, I just wanted to give a quick overview. Uh, yeah, thank thank you. I, I'll look forward to yeah. Thanks. Yeah. So in the interest of time, I just quickly uh, go through uh, the, the the general material like. Uh, in, in just in parallel computing, we have the shared memory model and the message passing model. Uh, it's the shared memory model. The synchronization is used by blocks and we use the threads and, and we, we use the shared memory to communicate. When message passing, we just pass messages. 
Uh, and usually uh, threads uh, are used for shared memory, parallelism, and actors and communicating sequential processes, CSP. These are very popular models for message passing, uh, parallelism. Uh, so uh, we have a lot of many core architectures, right? like CPUs, GPUs, the tensor processing unit, neuromorphic, and in future, can we have something like actor processing unit? Uh, that is my uh, interest. Uh, and actor model is very popular in software. There's, there's a lot of concurrency models, um, and none of them is, are really, there's no one perfect model. We, we use people in software, use a lot of them because they want to build a very responsive uh, and distributed applications. And actor model is very famous in software. Uh, and in the interest of time, I'm breezing through this this material uh, to, to get to the main material, like like that, the questions which Ada asked. So uh, we can always come back if we have some extra time. So actor model was basically invented in 50 years ago, 1973. Uh, it was actually inspired by both computer science and, uh, and symbolic artificial intelligence by Carl Hewitt of, of MIT. And uh, interest, but it became very popular in software instead of artificial intelligence. Uh, so he was uh, really excited about how we can connect a lot of process, uh, pro a lot of processors, and how we can use a swarm of these style of programming. Um, and uh, the actor model is basically you have a computation computation unit. It's it's like a bunch of little computers uh, talking to each other, and, and there are um, a lot of digital. Um, chips which are being built on this idea, which are both brain inspired and at the same time, uh, they are like, the, there are a lot of cores uh, on the chip and they talk and the cores send messages to each other. Uh, and this is not, even in hardware, this is being tried. Uh, so where there's a computational uh, unit and there's an internal state for the actor and, this, and the actors send messages. Uh, say a classic example is the bank account uh, in, in concurrency, uh, if you use a shared memory parallelism, uh, we have a, a shared region like balance. Uh, somebody is uh, depositing some money and somebody is withdrawing it. Usually, we in multi-threading we use the locks uh, to to make sure that we synchronize the transactions. But in actors is very different, where uh, each actor has its internal state, which is the balance here, uh, and then it gets a message: Hey, deposit some. Hey, hey, bank account actor, deposit. When it gets a message, deposit some money. And then it, inc it increments the balance and then if you withdraw it, it decrements. And nobody else has access to this balance. It's private uh, because in software, um, managing the shared mutable state is always the big problem. Uh, and either we disable mutation or we disable sharing. Uh, this is generally how, uh, or we synchronize the sharing using lots. This is, this is trade-offs which people use uh, in software and hardware. And, and we can construct a bigger um, actor software models uh, where, where we, they keep sending messages to solve the problem. And in the interest of time, I'll breeze through this quickly, but we can come back uh, to this. I just want you to get the higher idea, but when I explain the algorithm, you, you'll get a much better idea. Um, and it's also popular in modeling, like Professor Edward Lee, if you see Berkeley, he wrote two books. Um, and actors can be used to uh, model different kind of systems like process networks, discrete events, data flow, synchronous reactor systems, it's like um, spiking neural networks, they 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 fall into the synchronous synchronous reactor systems, and uh, and also they also fall into continuous time models. So you can do a whole lot of things with actors, and these are the books and resources. Um, uh, to, to motivate you um, uh, to uh, to just mention that actors is already popular in different fields, and can we bring it to artificial intelligence? Uh, so coming to the olfactory learning. Uh, approach Vam, uh, Vamsi, Vamsi. Yes. The, so so far what you told us is the actor model is a software component it's not a um concept it's not an intellectual concept uh the act yeah it is also an intellectual concept because there is a paper published uh, it, like from the theory of computation there's a lot of research into it and it's also implemented in hardware uh so it, it is it is an up it is a, a model of computation for parallel computing, parallel and concurrent computing. Um, and it's like a lens to look at computation. Um, uh, people uh, use it uh, to model different kinds of uh, concurrent computations, concurrent so, or, and or parallel computations. So it, it, it's more of a framework or a lens to look at. Right, so, so if we look at the, the code, the piece of code that you gave, there was 
uh, messages sent. Yeah. And there was uh, some computation because you increase the amount, decrease the amount. Yeah. What else is there? It could be you can add uh, all sort of uh, operations. Yes, yes. You can so you can do arbitrary things. So each actor is like a little computer. You can do many things. You can do it in software. You can do a whole lot of things. But in hardware, usually hardware actors, uh, you, you you can do a small subset of things. But the general idea is everything is driven by messages. So the, uh, usually in a system, you have a bunch of actors. Uh, all actors have some internal state variables, and all computation is achieved by message passing. Uh, and, uh, and 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 in the okay, let me let me ask ask a different way. So, yeah. is the actor a neuron, and is it is the message the synap the synaptic output input? Um, Can we say uh, that here we're looking at three neurons, and yeah. they're connected through this message passing instead of the synapses? So we we can model. Uh, a neuron as an actor, we can model the synapse as an actor, uh, because usually synapses have a learning rule, uh, which is the weight is the internal variable, and synapse get. No, uh, I mean, the, yeah, the synaptic output, the synaptic output, uh, physically, right? It will connect to another neuron. To yes. Transmit the message. So that's the message, basically. Yeah, that's a message. Yes, because e even like in neuroscience, uh, these synapses they receive ne neuroreceptors from the incoming neuron, and and they. Um, and they also, and a lot of molecular messages are sent between the incoming neuron and outgoing neuron. So there's a lot of messaging going on even in neuroscience, uh, but people usually model it as, an, as just a dumb uh, scalar value. Uh, but in reality, you can model it as an actor as well, uh, whose, uh, whose internal variable is the, is the weight of the, of the synapse. And, and then it, it gets messages from the, inc because in spike timing dependent plasticity, um, the synapse value is changed based on the timing of the incoming spike and also the timing of the outgoing spike. So, uh, so incoming so synapse can be modeled as uh, an actor which is receiving messages from the incoming and outgoing spike, and and a synapse is modifying its internal state, which is the weight, based on these messages. Um, yeah, it's it's it, it, it's like a modeling framework, and this is what this whole book is about: the system design modeling and simulation. This whole book uh, shows about Professor by Professor Edward Lee of UC Berkeley shows how various systems um, in embedded systems and cyber physical systems can be modeled using actors. And he wrote he has been working on this field for almost thirty years, and he published a lot of papers, and he has a lot of software, um, a lot of PhD students who produced uh, newer. Um, uh, um, more modification and improvements to the actor paradigm. So it is a well-researched topic. Um, so, uh, and coming back to our olfactory learning, I want to just give a quick overview of the olfactory learning. Uh, and these are the scientists who won the Nobel Prize in 2004 for discovering the principles, the neuroscientific principles. Uh, and basically whenever we smell some molecule, there's a region um, of the brain, uh, of the brain uh, the, it's called the olfactory bulb. Uh, and uh, here we, we we have receptors. We have three kinds of receptors in this cartoon diagram. But humans have about 400 receptors, uh, and uh, other animals have much in a higher number of re receptors. And you, and each receptor uh, binds to a certain part of the order molecule. So uh, here, uh, the, the the orange, purple, and blue receptors they bind to different parts of the order molecule. And all the orange receptors connect to this uh, orange mitral cell, and uh, all the purple receptors collect all the, the current from all of them com combines into one mitral cell, and then from mitral cells there are other bunch of cells called granule cells uh, which inhibit these mitral cells, and the whole and then the whole region of uh, brain regions which process this. Uh, I don't know much about this, but neuroscience people from neuroscience do a lot of research, and this is a huge field, uh, and this olfactory learning algorithm is actually based on um, uh, I'll go to the next slide where uh, we have this a small region called the external plexiform region. Uh, in this region where the mitral cells, MCs here, uh, these are the MCs and the granule cells here, uh, they, um, and they get these inputs uh, from the olfactory receptor neurons. And this is called, the, and they interact with each other. It's called the external plexiform layer, EPL. Uh, and the algorithm from Cornell University is modeling what is happening in this region. And they also done some other research uh, modeling um, other regions in the olfactory bulb. 
but this particular algorithm is heavily inspired by, by the, and they call it the EPL or the external plexiform re region. Uh, so, um, but from our purposes, the way is say, if there is some mo molecule or the molecule, we can also create an, a chemo sensor array, which an it's like an artificial nose. Uh, and the, the way these sensors behave is that this sensors out, each sensor uh, outputs an integer value between a certain range. Uh, so you have n equal to five sensor array um, and the dynamic range of the sensor is uh, some value between zero and 20. Um, and say, if you, if, you, if you expose this particular chemical sensor to one particular chemical molecule, say order one, we call it here, it could be an array of five numbers uh, and order two could be a different array of five numbers. So mathematically, uh, for all our practical purposes in this algorithm, we treat an, an order as an array of uh, an array of integers, uh, and the EPL algorithm is such that uh, you learn when you when you're given these different arrays of integers which correspond to different orders, you learn them, uh, and after learning, when you when you when I give a noise corrupted version, say order of, say nine instead of five seven ten, which is order one, uh, I some of the sensor readings could be corrupted because of noise, uh, and uh, this part this occluded they call when we pass in this occluded uh, array of integers, uh, this algorithm should be able to recall that, hey, this is the order one, which is five, seven, 10, and clean, clean up the order. This is what this EPL algorithm does uh, from, from our perspective, from a math, from algorithm and mathematical perspective, this is what it is trying to do. And this is how this algorithm works. And the spiking neural network algorithm has a lot of, lot of details, uh, the bio, because it has a lot of biology, uh, new, neuroscience built into it uh, and explaining it would it wouldn't it would itself take a lot of time? But I will I try to condense it in a very uh, high level uh, picture. Uh, say what we have is say we want to learn the order four seven just two sensors. We have two sensors. It's a very simple model. It's two sensors four and seven is the is the order the sensor readings, and we have this um, something mitral cell the spiking neurons here. Uh, we feed them as bias currents. These are not spikes, but we are feeding them as bias currents uh, to the spiking neurons. Uh, so uh, so higher the bias current well, and and these each and each each MC neuron has its own uh, granule cell GC neuron as we have seen in this, uh, the neuroscience picture, and uh, GC one GC two and G and each uh, GC receives inputs from the distant uh, remote MCs, uh, and um, so whenever MC spikes, uh, say M, uh, because its its current bias current is higher, so it's it spikes quickly. So it sends a spike uh, to its, its uh, distant GC, and then um, it's connected by a synapse, which has a certain weight in the delay. And the same thing, uh, MC1 spikes a little later because its value is lower, its bias current is lower. So it's connected to its uh, distant GC uh, and with a certain weight and delay. Um, and then um, as soon after some time, due to the delay in the synapse, uh, the spike from MC2 goes to GC1 and, and, and the GC1 spikes. And then the GC1 uh, is connected to its local MC always. Uh, and it, it, it tries to inhibit the local MC, MC cell. Uh, and, um, and during the learning phase, uh, the weight is zero. So uh, it, it has no impact. Uh, but during uh, the, the recall phase or, or the, um, the, the uh, sorry, during the learning phase, the weight is zero. But the, during the inference phase, the weight is non-zero. So we need, to, uh, we need to, when we switch between learning and inference, we need to change, update the weights in this particular model. Uh, and then with, due to with certain delay, the, the spike from GC1 uh, comes to the MC and it tries to inhibit the activity of the MC1. This is the high level picture. Uh, the same thing is happening at the GC2 side, uh, uh, but in, in, in this cartoon, we'll focus primarily on the GC1, what it is doing. Uh, all the GC2 is doing similar things because there's a lot of things going on in this network and it's really hard to understand this network. In, in, um, in the very first time. So if you don't follow it, uh, uh, this is it's it's okay because it's a very complicated. It took it took uh, a lot of time. Um, I worked for a month for months on this, and that's when I understood. So uh, and then we connect oscillatory neurons, uh, which gate the activity of the local MC neuron. So we here we see this clock cycle, uh, right? Um, this each cycle is uh, like twenty time steps because the dynamic range of our sensor is 20 time steps. Uh, so there is an on phase uh, during which the, the MC cells are on and there's off phase 
and this continues. So this one, this phase on and off phase combined is called a gamma cycle. And usually you train uh, this network for say five or 10 gamma cycles. Uh, so that's why you, you train this network for 200 times steps. So the, during the training, what happens is um, say, you MC two spikes in the on phase when, when the MCs are on, and after a little bit after that, and the MC one spikes, uh, and some, and after some time due to the delays, uh, when the MCs are off, the GCs are, the, the GCs uh, spike. That's how this network, the delays are designed. And then um, initially the delay is zero. The delay from the GC one to MC one, uh, the GC one to MC one uh, is um, zero. Uh, so uh, the spike from GC1 to MC1, uh, it gets emitted instantaneously, but since the weight is zero, it does not have any impact. Uh, and as the network progresses, and, as in, and in the next on cycle, and both the MC2 and MC1 spike, uh, and then uh, again, the GC1 will spike, but now the delay will increase uh, because it is using a delay spike timing dependent learn, learning plasticity, uh, where the timing of MC1 spike and GC1 spike increases the delay value and so what happens is uh, the spike from GC1 to MC1, it gets, it gets delayed in time and it comes a little later. And as this uh, learning progresses for multiple time steps, uh, what happens is that the delay, it increases, it learns. Uh, so finally what happens is um, the delay, uh, uh, the, delay uh, the delay it learns uh, is such that after some time, uh, the spike from GC1 to MC1 occurs exactly when MC1 is firing. Uh, so if you look at it from a very high level conceptual view, what this network is learning is uh, the GC1, uh, which is, is learning when its local MC uh, will actually fire uh, based on uh, firing of its remote MC2. So it's creating some sort of map. What it is saying is uh, if my local, uh, my distant MC value is seven, my local MC will fire is value of four. It's really, because in, in neural networks, uh, we don't have symbolic logic. Like uh, this is just a simple map in, in, uh, in symbolic computing, like computer code is very simple, but uh, because you have to do the symbolic uh, processing using uh, spiking neuron primitives, uh, you have to do this in a such a roundabout manner. And there's a whole lot of details if you want to learn multiple orders and there's a lot of details. And, uh, but this is the basic idea here. There's a spiking neural network algorithm here is what it is trying to do is it is sending spikes and it is, it, it is just learning a correlation. What the correlation with it, which it is learning is if my MC2 value input is seven, then my local value is four. And, and at the GC2 level, it is learning the same thing. What it is learning is if my distant MC1 is the value is four, then my local value is uh, seven, the bias current is seven. But since it cannot represent things in bias currents and things like that, uh, everything has to be done through the spikes. Uh, so nature was able to evolve this algorithm using spikes. Uh, but uh, what I noticed is that uh, if you look at the very high level computation, I took a, a reductionist approach because this is a constructionist bottom up approach. And I took a top down reductionist approach um, using um, actors. Uh, and, and I'll show you how the same algorithm can be implemented using actors. Um, so uh, please, if this, if this is whole algorithm is a little confusing, please don't. Uh, mind because it, it is very confusing because um, even um, for the scientists in the team when I was working, they, it was not clear what exactly this thing was doing. And that that motivated me uh, to come up with the actor algorithm. As basically, I was trying to create a hypothesis. Okay, this is what this network is doing. So, and if you look at the actors, uh, you can see why it's, uh, and Adal, I think he asked uh, why it takes 200 time steps. Uh, so now I think you get some basic idea why it takes 200 time steps, uh, because you need to do this uh, for uh, um, at least five gamma cycle, and each gamma cycle is like 400 algorithm, sorry, 40 algorithmic time steps. So you need five times 40, which is 200 algorithmic time steps to achieve this uh, learning here. Uh, the, so the, the, this is where the 200 time steps is coming, in, and and along on all these 200 time steps, uh, you need to do the spike timing dependent plasticity learning. So the weights are being constantly updated. So there's a lot of processing going on and there's a lot of computation involved here. And if you use actors, uh, for the same model where we, we have two sensors and we want to learn one order. Um, here I have two actors, which is called, first actor is called MC1 
and it has its corresponding GC uh, one GC blob. Usually um, uh, in neuroscience, you have not just one GC, but a blob of GCs. Uh, so I'm, I'm modeling it as an actor. And similarly, uh, the, uh, the other MC2, it also has its own GC2. And so what is, say we want to feed the, uh, oh, sorry, the values are not showing the sensor. Oh, okay, we are feeding the four and seven. So what happens is the MC2 value is fed into its distant GC and MC1 value is fed into its distant GC2. Uh, and say if we have, a, the order we want to learn is four, four or seven. So first what the, the MC actors, what they do is they make a copy of the, uh, the sensor reading they receive. And then uh, what uh, they do is they send the copy uh, of this value, uh, we, the values directly. We, we don't operate on spikes anymore. We just, just directly send the values of these um, sensor readings as integers. We directly send integer messages. Uh, so we send the values to both its local MC and the, sorry, the local GC and the remote GC. And uh, so that is what is happening here. So MC2 is sending its uh, va value of sensor reading seven and MC1 is sending its value four to its distant GCs. So what this GC will now do is it's create a it creates a mapping, which is just like a, a dictionary in Python uh, or a hash map in computer science. So what it is, to, it, what the map it is saying is that if my MC2, if my, if my distant MC value is seven, my local MC value is four. It's just a simple map. Uh, this is very easy to, easy to do in computer science and in a digital computer, but this is very hard to do in a spiking neural network. Uh, uh, and the same thing, uh, the GC is, is creating a map, it's creating, uh, it's storing a map, uh, a hash map. It's saying that if my local value is MC2 is seven, my, my distant MC1 value is four, it's just creating a mapping. And uh, this is all, this is just learning, is just memorizing this thing. Learning, it doesn't really look so exciting, but it's just memorizing this mapping. And uh, to do the same thing in using spiking neurons, it's very complicated because everything should be done using the dynamics of spiking neurons and using binary valued spikes. But here uh, we are at a much higher level of abstraction. Uh, a digital computer can, can do much more uh, higher level operations compared to a spiking neuron. Uh, so that, that is the reason. So uh, what the learning which took 200 time steps in spiking neurons, the same thing can be done with just one time step of message passing between actors here. So this is what I meant by one time step of message passing between actors. Uh, the, the really, um, the powerful intuition here is uh, we are using the connectionist idea of uh, sending messages like spiking neurons, but we are also uh, taking ideas from the symbolic AI or digital computers, but now we are able to represent symbols like hash map is a symbolic data structure like tree, uh, linked list, uh, um, all these are symbolic data structures uh, which, uh, which form the primitives of uh, digital logic computing, uh, but implementing all of these uh, using the uh, spiking neuron primitives is not so easy. Uh, so we are taking a, a reductionist approach, uh, whereas the spiking neural network approach is a constructionist approach. Uh, so which is better? It's hard to tell. And, and can this um, be generalized? It's also hard to tell. But, but the learning is very simple and trivial in this uh, manner. And likewise, uh, you, you can learn uh, multiple orders. So you want to learn a new order. We already learned four, seven as the order and you want to learn a new order. Uh, and sorry, this is it. This is the recall phase. Say now you learn the order four, seven, and now I'm, I'm corrupting the sensor reading. So the first sensor reading is corrupted. Instead of four, I'm corrupting it with a noise model. Uh, there are different noise models which you can use and say it's now nine and seven. So the same thing. Uh, now uh, each M, the MC sends the value. Uh, it forwards it as a message. Uh, it sends an integer value as a message to its uh, lo local uh, GCs, and also they get the input from the distant MCs, uh, and then uh, they do the dictionary lookup, it's hash map lookup. Okay, so GC2 will look up, if my sensor MC1 is four, my MC2 should be seven, so it now notice that my MC1 is not four, it's actually nine, it's because there's something wrong here. So it says the key not found, you know, I don't find the key here, so do nothing. Uh, and whereas um, the GC block, a one, it does a dictionary lookup, it found the value of seven, MC2 is seven, that's correct. Uh, but it noticed that MC1 is, should be four. The dictionary mapping is if MC2 is seven, my MC1 should be four. Uh, oh, this, does, this key does not, uh, the value is wrong. The key exists, but the value is wrong. So what the GC blob will do is send a message. Hey, 
I found the key, but the value is a mismatch. Uh, so it will correct the MC value. So what the algorithm will send a message, hey, G, the TC1 will send a message to MC1 and say, hey, correct your sensor readings. And instead of nine, it will, con it will oh, sorry, uh, it, instead of nine, uh, it will correct this value into four. It will correct the value into four. Hey, this is not nine. This is, so this is, it got corrupted due to noise. It, its value is actually four. And then the propagation again continues. So I think it will go to the next slide. The same thing. Uh, okay, it will correct the value from nine to four. And now the propagation continues. Okay, MC1 will send the value four and seven, and it does the propagation. And now uh, when it does this lookup in the GC2, okay, when it does the dictionary lookup, it says, hey, I found my key value and I found my value also. Uh, they're correct. Uh, and it says key found and value found, there's nothing to do here. And then it immediately knows that it is order one because it has a mapping stored. And this is a trivial option, uh, trivial thing to do in uh, using symbolic logic, but it's a hard thing to do using connectionist either artificial neurons or spiking neurons, this kind of high level symbolic logic is not so easy to implement. And the same thing, the GC blob uh, one, it does this dictionary lookup and says, hey, my MC2 value is seven, my MC1 value is four, hey, I found this, this is order one, it also says order one, and then we do a majority voting, uh, and then we can say, hey, quickly, we can very quickly say this is order one. Uh, but if you do, if you have to do the same thing using the spiking neural net algorithm, uh, you have to run this, um, uh, even during uh, inference, uh, first you learn the order and then you change the weights uh, and then you do the inference. And when, and when, when you feed a noise corrupted version during inference, uh, it produces a spike train uh, each and every, because in the real algorithm, you have hundreds of uh, MC neurons. So each MC neuron produces a spike, spike train, a spike output, and then you have to do a post-processing actually, a post-processing. Uh, and I will explain this in a different slide. Uh, actually. I'll, uh, because we have very little time, so I'll quickly move to the summary. Um, and, and then the same way you can learn multiple orders. It's not, I think you got the gist of what we're trying to do here. Uh, so this is the comparison between SNN and, and the actors. So the AI paradigm is, uh, the spiking neural network is using connectionist AI and also dynamicism because this, uh, the spiking neural network is like a spatiotemporal attractor. Uh, so it's a it's, it is also using dynamicism uh, but whereas actors is combining all three, connectionism, dynamicism, and symbol, symbolism, all three models of AI. Uh, and so the spiking neural network needs 200 time steps, but actors only needs one time step. And the learning room in, uh, in spiking neural networks is spike timing dependent plasticity, whereas uh, in actors, you don't need any uh, spike timing based learning rule because we're completely eliminating all spike time based codes. So when you don't have any spike time based codes, you don't need any spike time based learning. So you just directly store the mapping, but you use high level uh, data structures like a hash map. Um, and even while like inference uh, or recall, uh, it needs 200 time steps. SNN needs 200 time steps, but inference in actors, we need just three time steps of message passing between the actors to, inf to, to basically clean up the noise and actually infer what order it is. Uh, so uh, in, in SNN model, we need to uh, post process the spike train uh, we, we need to look at the, all the spikes and we need to apply and post-process the spike train. But whereas in the actor algorithm, there's no post-processing required, you immediately know the answer. It's very fast. Um, and the spiking neural not model, uh, to learn new orders, you need to create new neurons. You need to create new GC neurons. To learn new, new, new order, usually you require at least uh, five to 25 new uh, GC neurons. And biology, it, it, it happens by a process of neurogenesis where we create new, new neurons, but whereas in actors, you just add extra memory. And also uh, the SNN model needs a lot of oscillatory circuits because you need to create all these gamma cycles and theta cycles. And uh, usually in biology, they have a lot of oscillatory circuits, but whereas uh, in actors, you don't need any oscillatory circuits. It's completely asynchronous. It's 100% asynchronous. So if you implement actors in hardware, it will actually be much more energy efficient because you don't need all these clocks and all this uh, asynchronous hardware is much more energy efficient. Uh, and although I have not built a chip out of it, but uh, as an electrical engineer, I, intuitively I can feel that the, the, it, 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 it is much more energy efficient because you don't need 200 time steps of STDP and then you don't need any clocking and all sorts of synchronization. So, uh, so as the temporal dynamics, this is a synchronous reactor system, but whereas the actor model is 100% asynchronous. Everybody, every mess, every actor sends asynchronous messages and it reacts to those messages. 
but the only downside is uh, actor model is purely, purely digital only, uh, but where spiking neural networks can be implemented on a digital chip or also an analog chip, although analog has its own drawbacks. Uh, right now, um, Intel low E is a digital chip. It's a, it's a purely digital chip, um, but it, it, it uses a lot of principles uh, uh, from actor model and the communicating sequential processes model. Uh, and the message type in, in SNN is a binary spike, whereas in the actors is, in this model, we use integer valued messages. Uh, so uh, my, my hope is that the energy consumption um, is, uh, for the spiking model, it is really energy efficient. It's much better than one Neumann computers like CPUs and GPUs. Uh, but whereas this, if I implement this actors in, uh, in hardware, uh, I, I am hope I'm I'm hopeful that uh, it will be much more energy efficient even than spiking neural network. So it can be much more energy efficient compared to neuromorphic computing as well. Uh, so uh, my hope is that uh, all the, uh, the PhD students and grad students and uh, scientists in your team, uh, because you have deep knowledge of mathematics and other scientific uh, areas, uh, so you you might know a lot of other new um, ideas. Uh, and you know a lot more than me about uh, all these things, uh, the mathematics and dif different systems. Uh, so you you could you are in a better, much better position than me to do further research uh, into these paradigms because you're you're already working on spiking neural networks, but you could also look into this actor model and things like that and see uh, w what are the um, different things. So the big idea is we are com combining the connectionism of deep learning and uh, and spiking neural networks. And we're combining with symbol processing, symbol, symbol processing, uh, because e even like in AlphaGo, uh, it uses Monte Carlo tree search approach, and tree search is a very symbolic idea. It's it's, it's an idea from the uh, computer science and uh, and symbolic AI. So the idea is if we combine uh, uh, connectionism, which is of artificial neural networks and spiking neural networks, with the symbol processing, we could do much more, many more things, and also uh, the neurons. Uh, in artificial neurons and spiking neurons, they're not programmable. Uh, full, they're not fully programmable like digital logic computers. Uh, so uh, a spiking neuron is like an old uh, 500 million uh, evolutionary hammer, uh, whereas actors can be treated as um, a modern day tools where you can, uh, for a given problem, you can always customize your actors. You can define what they do for the given problem. And you're trying to reduce the communication cost because there's a trade-off between uh, computation and communication, because in, in neural network models, the, the compute element is always the same, it's fixed. Uh, so the overhead comes from the, the communication. You have to spend send a lot of spikes, you have to send uh, some spike coded message. Uh, uh, so the communication is expensive. Uh, whereas an actor model, we are trying to find the balance between the right compute element. Like we, we choose, we customize the compute, compute in nodes where the actors are customized depending on the problem. So that way we're reducing the communication. So uh, the spiking neurons needed 200 time steps of communication uh, using spiking messages. That, that's why we reduced it from 200 time steps to one time step using actors, because there is this trade-off between compute and communication trade-off, which we have seen. Um, and, uh, and as we have noticed, if, you, if, we, if we take a bottom-up bottom uh, constructionist approach uh, from neuroscience, uh, the good thing is we get to take the learning from neuroscience and we can convert into algorithms. But the bad thing is that all these neuroscience algorithms, they have a lot of biological clutter in them, a lot of biological details, which we don't really need to implement high level algorithms. So what uh, this actor-based algorithm is, uh, has done is by taking a top-down reductionist approach, uh, we got rid of all the biological clutter and we can just implement uh, these algorithms. Like, so going back to Mars, uh, three levels of analysis, when we have a problem where we want to do some computation, uh, we want to figure out what the algorithm is, and we 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 customize that algorithm to a given uh, physical substrate or implementation we have. So in biology, found in biology we do it using the flapping of the wings, uh, but we can also do it in other ways. Uh, so the same approach can be used for artificial intelligence also. Uh, while we take inspiration from neuroscience and biology, and it's great to learn what from all these fields. Uh, perhaps we could also do some top-down design. Um, and when, when, when combining this, both the bottom-up and the top-down approaches, um, hopefully we can produce better uh, artificial intelligence algorithms and computing hardware uh, and take the field forward. And uh, my, um, my sincere uh, uh, re request to all of you is that 
I'm requesting all the STEM scientists and graduate students in your team to do uh, to look at these ideas and do further research. Uh, that's my uh, request to all of you. And uh, th thank you so much for the time. Uh, I really appreciate the time you have given me to explain this algorithm. Thank you very much, Vamsi. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor George. Do we have questions for Vamsi? Hi, uh, this is Chen from Brown University. Uh, I have some questions. Uh, hi, Chen. Yeah, hi. Uh, first, um, uh, I've seen that it's a very successful model for the um, so-called olfactory learning. So uh, is there any other examples like uh, classification of images by chemist or even further on separate 10? Um, and no, actually, this olfactory learning algorithm, there was some attempts made to see how this um, the spiking neural network based olfactory learning can be applied to other other fields. Uh, there was some work, but it it, it was not so straightforward. Um, so uh, I don't know if other people are doing any research, uh, but it, uh, because this is a very specific algorithm which was invented by studying the neuroscience um, and of the of the uh, of the neuroscience of the olfactory bulb and mapping it to a different domains is not so simple because the nature seems to have evolved this algorithm specifically for the purpose of uh, olfaction. Uh, but um, the, the ideas can be generalized to other domains. Okay, thank you. And uh, um, well, like in the uh, neural neuromorphic supercomputer named Loi, he was in the Intel, I think you've already known that. It's a neuromorphic hardware that's implementing the SNN on it. Is it possible to build something like um, to implement the actor models on such uh, specific advanced yes. hardware later so that it, other algorithms can be accelerated? Yeah, I, I mean, uh, Lohi 3, it's, this is in public domain information, like Lohi 3 has the ability to implement um, um, arbitrary, uh, it can implement, um, the neurons can implement int integer arithmetic. You can create an arbitrary neuron which implements your own computer code um, and it can send messages. So in principle, it is doable in low E2. Uh, but since um, I'm no longer with the low E2 team, low E team, I moved out of the team last year. Uh, I don't know if anybody is doing it, but in principle, it is doable. And it is also possible to build chips um, which, do, which does that. Or in FPGAs, or you can create your, somebody can create their own ASIC and implement this in hardware. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Chair. Hey, uh, this is Adar again. Uh, if I may ask another question, a uh, follow-up question to sure. Chian. Uh, and also, first of all, uh, like, this is a very uh, interesting algorithm. I enjoyed also the explanation with the animations. That's a very good, exp you explain it very well. And I, uh, really enjoyed looking at it. Thank so, uh, following up uh, uh, what Chian said about extending this, I want to actually go uh, deeper. So, the yeah. other example is actually uh, in your favor because it's inherently binary, uh, if I understand correctly. Like, you either have the number five there or you don't, right? So, you can basically represent the order by a binary vector. However, if you are trying to like take some arbitrary signal, like an image yeah. or a function or something like that, you will have to add another layer of abstraction to that. And then you're back to either time steps, which will complicate your model, uh, like scale to the number of time steps, right? And we're yes. back to, yeah. Okay. That, that, that is true. And um, this algorithm happens to be very favorable to the actual model, but uh, from the research, which uh, like Professor Edward Lee has done uh, from UC Berkeley, uh, uh, what uh, it, it, it has been shown that actors can model a whole range of systems. Actors, they can use model process network, discrete event systems, data flow, synchronous reactive, continuous time models. Uh, and he has, his research team has done a lot of PhD theses and they have shown how you can use this basic framework, the actor framework to actually model a whole range of systems. Um, and, and this entire book is about like system design modeling and simulation. Like, he is a very proponent, he's a proponent of actor model. Uh, and this, even this book also like introduction to embedded systems, uh, they show um, how these actors can be used to model a whole bunch of uh, systems, uh, much like beyond, even beyond even spiking neural network models. You, you can think of this as like a superset of spiking neural network models. You can do a lot of things. And that is why this, this field needs more research because the problem is, uh, the people in different fields are not talking to each other. 
so uh, that is the reason. Uh, right now, this thing is only popular in actor models, popular in software and certain fields like uh, embedded systems. Uh, but uh, if diff people from different fields look at this uh, from this approach, and the, the other thing is also this uh, uh, diagram which we want to use, right? So right now we are all focused on the brain-based uh, uh, approach. Um, we're looking at like Captain Kirk, how what is happening inside the head of Captain Kirk? But the, the whole uh, range of models uh, in different um, in different brain, different compute architectures that are possible, and we don't know uh, which one of them is really optimal for given such a certain class of problems. Uh, so this is the kind of like a, um, uh, we, uh, a search. We have a huge search space here. And right now, the only thing we are looking at is based on from what biology is doing. Uh, but uh, it is quite possible that we can do something else. And that we don't know. Uh, Ramsey, can I just, uh, uh, when the SNNs came around and, and they, they, they basically, instead of saying SNNs are good and so on, they, they try to do the benchmark that ANNs do. Yeah. Um, like the tiny MNIST, uh, CIFAR-10 that Chan mentioned and so on, one after the other. And then the, uh, gradually they, they got some success in terms of accuracy, um, yeah. a little bit of efficiency and so on. So in other words, they did it by, they kind of established themselves by example. Yes. Here, here you have one example, which is interesting, but you kind of admit that it is now difficult to generalize to other tasks unless we understand the human brain, but that will take 100 years or 200 uh, years. Uh, we, we, yeah, we don't need to really understand the human brain. No, I mean, look, you, you, yeah. you're, the, 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 um, for the smell, you refer to the two, two people who got the Nobel Prize, so we need to... I, I don't, I mean, <laughs> oh, oh, you use I that as an argument that this this, this is a mechanism. So you need to understand these mechanisms to go to. So do we need to wait 100 years to uh, to, gen, to to learn how to generalize this? No, no, no Professor. My, my, my thing is, um, the, right now, all the neuroscience research is a constructionist approach. They're going from bottom up. Uh, but all this actor model and everything is like a top-down approach. Uh, so uh, we can take... Um, all these algor various algorithms, and we can take an, a top-down approach, uh, even the existing algorithms. Right. So, so uh, something specific, because I, you know, I, I, you have you have lots of good points, but uh, but uh, let's be specific. Uh, for, uh, tiny, 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 tiny mnist. How can you do the the tiny mnist? Tiny mnist because back propagation uh, can be modeled using actors, and that is how you can do tiny mnist. Uh, back propagation is inherently a message passing algorithm, right? You have forward pass. Right. passing messages and there's a backward pass, pass passing messages and people don't do it because it's an overkill uh, but um, it is possible to do that so th this is the, this is the research area which uh, uh, needs to be explored so I, I don't know all the answers uh, but uh, basically actor model is just a way of dealing with the parallelism so if, if we go back to uh, this slide uh, actor model is just a, con a concurrency paradigm because people use threads and logs and all sorts of functional programming and all sorts of things. So any problem which where you have a lot of parallel parallelism going on, you can you can map it into an actor model. So uh, the question is, what are the algorithms like? You are best suited, like you are experts in uh, certain domains, so you know the algorithms. So how can they map be mapped to actors as a research area? Because anywhere there's parallelism, you can map it into actors. Uh, that, that that is a high level message which I would like to give. Um, it, it, so it, whatever algorithm you have, uh, and spiking neural networks is also a message based uh, algorithm, right? The spikes we're sending certain messages, and a spiking neuron is like an actor because it's internal state where the, the state variables are like the current and voltage of that particular neuron, and they're the internal states. But it is a very, it's a very uh, analog. It, it's implemented on an analog physical su uh, substrate. Uh, because of the biological constraints, but here actors is more like a digital logic uh, version of uh, uh, the spiking neurons, and you can do much more uh, arbitrary computations. Um, and so uh, this model is just you can apply actors to a whole lot of problems, and that's why people use this in software. Uh, so actor is not a very specific thing; it's just a way of dealing with with the concurrency. Uh, so the, the hard part is well, what are the other 
uh, algorithms from AI and mathematics and science and other fields that can be mapped into it. And uh, this book is, uh, by Professor Edward Lee, he talks about how you can model various systems, uh, but people are not using this actor model for artificial intelligence. So like um, Carl Hewitt, he actually wanted to, he, 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 when he was with Professor Marvin Minsky at MIT, he used his actor model to do symbolic logic, uh, symbolic AI. Um, and that, that, that was, so that was the original motivation for this research. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, Vamsi. That, that's what's, uh, 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 something different uh, today. Panos, Panos really has a question. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, sorry. I, I couldn't uh, be here for the whole talk, but I want to ask a question as a follow-up to what other and uh, George asked. So if you go to the example that you showed with the order, right? I mean, yes. what Adar said is there that you have something binary. But I expect that if you have an order that has a lot of components there, so if your order vector yeah. has a lot of components, I see an explosion in the number of communications that you have to do with these Python scripts. Because if you uh -huh. have for each uh, component of this vector, you need to have a one message that goes to the other components, uh, right? Actually, no, no, no. Actually, I didn't explain the whole thing because when you expand it to a huge number, the, uh, nature does a lot of tricks. And I, and, and I took the same trick from biology. So you don't send messages to all of them. So if, if you see this uh, um, in this slide here, uh, we don't have to, uh, we don't have to send a message to all of them. We just uh, send a message to a few, a small subset of them. So this is what happens in the spiking neural network algorithm as well. Uh, we don't send a message from the MC neurons, from each MC neuron to other, all of the GC neurons. So you have uh, 10,000 GC neurons. We don't send messages to all of them. We just send a message to a small fraction of them. But, but, but how do you decide what is small here and there has to be some way to decide to how what is the neighborhood that you have to send the messages to. It is, right? it is, uh, in spiking neural network algorithm, the, then the neighborhood is actually learned. And I, and I found that you can also do random connectivity. Uh, if you do completely random connectivity uh, with a certain subset, say um, each MC neuron sends, uh, um, say, 0.05% of the GCs, it sends the messages to 0.05% of sorry, not 0 0.05, it's like 5% of GCs, it sends the messages to them. That in itself is enough to clean up this order. Uh, yeah, this- that, Right, right, right. But, 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 but you see that this assumes that there is some kind of neighborhood that if you cover, then you are fine. And this uh, is not guaranteed for uh, all uh, systems. Yes, that, that is true. Um, and that is true for even spiking neural network systems also, right? Because the nature, it tries to sparsify uh, both, there's a lot of spatiotemporal sparsity in, even in biology. So what nature does it's, uh, if I go back to this curve here, uh, so uh, as, the, as the noise in the system increases, even both the spiking neuron model and the actor model, after a certain accuracy, it, uh, it is not able to clean up uh, the odors so because it is only, there's a small neighborhood of messages. So in order, if, you, if it gets messages from all the, all the MCs, you can still clean it up, even though there's a lot of noise, but that is the price we pay. So uh, there's always this neighborhood effect in both of these algorithms. Okay, yeah, I, I cannot argue with yeah. this. I don't really understand yeah, how, actually, how it works. It's just that I'm afraid a little bit with this reduction in approach that you mentioned, which goes from top down, that sometimes if you look at a very high level, it hides the it hides the details, and sometimes the scaling issues happen when you go down to the small scale details. There, no, what you asked is a very it's a great, great question because even the spiking neural network approach, which is inspired of biology, it has scaling issues. Uh, this algorithm um, uh, it needs a lot of neurons as the size increases. Um, so um, uh, the scaling issues are not really uh, only in the actor model. Because the actor model is trying to copy what the spiking neurons is trying to do, so both of them have the same issues. Uh, uh, right, and, right. I, I, yeah. I know that other methods have also issues. I just want to understand why this one does not have certain issues that other methods oh. have. Yes. So, yeah, yeah, but. yeah. This is like uh, inspiration from biology, right? Nature has found a way to uh, 
uh, right? Even with the small neighborhood of connectivity. Uh, so what happens is if I, if you, because I didn't connect, I didn't cover all, all the parts here. So when we go to, uh, say we have say 100 uh, sensor readings, so uh, only a small fr fraction of so this GC here, uh, it requ it gets messages from only a small subset of MCs, but that is enough to clean it up because it is using that information to clean up its local MC value. And then there is a cascading effect. Once you clean up for one value, it helps in cleaning up the other values. So there's a cascading effect where after some time when the network, it's a, like a spatial temporal attractor. Uh, so uh, this is this is like a spatial temporal attractor. Like once you start cleaning up some values, uh, that will automatically go down this go down this, attra this attractor basin. You, it ends up in uh, in the clean version of that. So it's like conditioning in probability yes. where you keep you keep conditioning more and more and that accelerates somehow the sampling. Uh, yes. And okay. yeah, it is using um, the spatial temporal attractor dynamics. Uh, uh, okay. So th All that right. is the reason why it's able to do that. All right, thank you. I don't want to take up more of the time of the seminar, so but I will have to read more about the actor model, but this is an interesting and fascinating topic. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Penas. Thank you for the question. Yeah. It was a great question. Thank you, Vamsi, for uh, taking your time and uh, joining us and giving us this wonderful talk. Thank you, Sambhat. I appreciate the time. Uh, thank you, everyone, for uh, listening to the presentation. And I, if you can think of some ideas, uh, uh, please uh, come up with some ideas because you, you are experts. You have free time. You're full-time scientists. I'm just a part-time guy. So I have a day job, but, but I can't think about all these ideas. But if you have any ideas, kindly, uh, I just want you to look at things from a different perspective because right now, after the artificial neural networks and deep learning, uh, spiking neural networks became famous, but there could be other ways to look, approach artificial intelligence as well. That's my key message. Like it's a diversity of different ideas which will lead to artificial intelligence. So please, uh, I request all of you to think in this direction and thank you for your time. I greatly appreciate this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll move on to our second speaker. Um, our second speaker is Dr. Simin Shekharpaz. Uh, Simin, you may want to uh, share your screen. Sure. So a little bit about her. She received her PhD in applied mathematics from the Shahid Beheshti University, Iran, Iran in 2017. After her PhD, she worked at Sharif University of Technology as a postdoctoral researcher in the field of machine learning. And currently, she's, uh, she's one of our teammates at Crunch from March 1st. And uh, her research interests include scientific machine learning for inverse problems. With that, I would like to uh, give over the flow to her. You may want to start, Shalim. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Uh, hello to all, and thank you for a nice introduction, Samdata. And uh, today I am going to talk about uh, our recent work, Physics Inform Adversarial Training uh, for Solving Partial Differential Equation. And this is a joint work with uh, my colleagues at uh, Sharif University of Technology. Uh, and uh, yes. Uh, uh, my talk is uh, divided into uh, these parts, physics inform neural network. Then uh, I will talk about um, physics inform adversarial training um, of neural network for solving differential equation. And then I will talk about Gaussian smoothing and weight decay. And at the end, I will present some numerical examples uh, to show the efficiency of uh, our proposed method. And uh, also I will uh, compare the results with uh, PIN uh, in this example. Uh, okay, uh, as you know, the efficiency of uh, deep learning has been uh, shown in various uh, scientific, uh, scientific fields, such as computer vision, natural uh, language processing, robotics, and physics simulation. Uh, one of uh, effective application of uh, deep neural network is to approximate the solution of uh, physical systems. Uh, 
Um, this idea, I mean the idea of using neural network for solving partial differential equation, uh, was first uh, studied by researchers in um, around the years 1990. And uh, then after that, uh, in uh, 2000, 2019, uh, RAISI um, introduced a physics informed neural network uh, to solve a differential equation in which the underlying uh, um, PDE and also boundary condition are enforced throughout uh, the minimization of loss function. Uh, then, uh, Pin, uh, pins was uh, very successfully uh, used for solving different classes of uh, PDs, such as integral differential equation, fractional equations, um, inverse problem, stochastic uh, differential, differential equations, and so on. Uh, some of the recent extensions of pins are uh, C pins. Uh, uh, HPV pin, uh, X pin, uh, in which, uh, for example, the V pin can be uh, used to solve a uh, weak form of uh, PDE. And uh, also, um, they are uh, used for um, different type of PDEs to um, produce the uh, correct uh, solutions. Uh, DeepXD Deep also is a deep learning library for solving differential equations by using a PIN, and which makes the code uh, more efficient. Okay, to uh, talk about uh, PIN, let us consider um, an original equation. Uh, you can see here by equation uh, one. In here, we consider a um, nonlinear differential equation in which n is a, a nonlinear differential operator and u is uh, the unknown solution which uh, we want to obtain. And h and g are uh, noun function, omega is a domain in R RD. And uh, for solving uh, this problem by using uh, PIN, a feed-forward neural network is uh, used to approximate the solution of uh, problem. Uh, then each uh, hide and neuron uh, of neural network in layer I can be expressed as uh, this formulation, uh, where XI are uh, the inputs of uh, the networks, and also W and B are weight and biases. And the output of last layer, which can be considered as uh, Y1L, is used to approximate uh, the solution of a uh, problem. Uh, sigma is also the activation function. And then the weight and biases are initialized and um, updated uh, by solving minimization problem. In this minimization problem, we have uh, the sum of uh, loss functions. Uh, the first term is uh, residual loss, boundary loss, and initial loss. Then after uh, solving this minimization problem and obtaining uh, the weight and biases, the solution is computed. In here, you can see the schematic of uh, PIN for solving the partial differential equation, as you can see here. The inputs of networks are uh, X and T, and then after <clears throat> the effect of uh, um, parameters and also uh, the activation function, uh, the output of network uh, should be U, which is uh, the approximate solution. And then um, by considering the automatic differentiation, we obtain residual. And in here, we minimize uh, the loss function, the sum of loss function. Uh, then the um, parameters, I mean the weight and biases are obtained. And uh, this procedure, procedure will be continued until the optimal solution uh, or the optimal value of parameters is obtained. Uh, okay, now I want to talk about uh, physics informal adversary and training of a neural network. Uh, 
physics in form adversary on training is a general generalized um, method uh, to improve the um, pin uh, which uh, eight, which uh, in which AT has been proved to be effective against the adversarial examples uh, what are the adversarial examples uh, in adversarial examples uh, uh, adding the adversarial perturbations uh, results uh, in um, incorrect outputs. Uh, it means that and the model uh, might be failed to uh, obtain the correct output. Okay, uh, so um, to explain uh, this method, uh, at first, uh, we consider the standard uh, training, um, which is uh, here. In here, we want to obtain the parameters, and uh, then uh, uh, we have uh, loss function. Loss function, the first term is residual loss, uh, second term is boundary loss, and third term is uh, um, initial loss. Uh, as you can see here, y1, y2, and y3 are uh, the right-hand side of uh, these equations. And uh, now when we want to solve this, uh, I mean the original problem by using adversarial training, uh, we have two parts in adversarial training. In first part, uh, we add a, a small part operation to the inputs. Uh, so we want to maximize uh, this first operation. So we should solve a maximization problem. In the second part, after obtaining the um, first operation, uh, we should obtain the weight and biases. I mean the parameters of the network. Then after obtaining the weight and biases, the solutions are obtained. And then we continue the procedure until uh, obtaining the optimal value of uh, weight and biases. Here you can see um, the uh, value of uh, parameters. In here, theta uh, are uh, parameters of the network, and uh, delta are uh, noise which uh, are added to the input. X and TR input, inputs, and a delta, uh, which is a vector of delta X and delta T, uh, are the noise uh, that are added to the input, as you can see here. Uh, also, in here should be Y prim, sorry, near is Y prim, which is Y prim is uh, the right hand side of uh, the boundary condition and initial condition that is considered as here. Uh, so after solving a min max problem, uh, we can obtain the solution of uh, original problem. Here also you can see the schematic of uh, adversarial. Sorry to interrupt, can I ask a question? Uh, yes, please. Uh, this is Nata Sandia. Um, okay. The, I, I'm used to seeing for again, you know, in the context of classification and a discriminator and a generator and so on. Is mm -hmm. this formulation for regression on your previous slide something that you came up with or is this something standard as like a regression version of the min-max problem? Yes, the first one, this formulation is the standard training and this formulation is for adversarial training, yes. But is this like, is this something you found in the literature? Or is this something that- Yes, you... yes, yes, yes. This formulation is in literature for adversarial training. I see. Okay, okay, thank you. You're welcome. So, uh, hello, this is Lulu. I have also one question here. Yes, please. Uh, yes. So, so here in the slide you mentioned is the data, the perturbations is maximized before go to the next step. So I was wondering, so in practice, when I do this coding or training, do you, let's say optimize the, the data until it converged, then go to the optimization of the theta, or just optimize data for a few iterations. Uh, in here, uh, 
uh, we optimize delta in uh, each sample. Each sample, it means uh, boundary uh, samples or uh, uh, allocation samples. Then after maximization delta, uh, we obtain the parameters of network. No, no, so I, mean, I think Lulu asked, how do you optimize to obtain the optimal delta? So uh -huh, normally uh -huh. we do that by gradient descent, but how do you do that for yes, this yes, delta? Yes. By projected gradient descent, uh, we obtain the uh, delta, I mean the uh, noise. We, maxim we solve the maximization problem. So yeah, how, how, many how, mm, how many mm. steps? How many steps? How many steps do you use? Uh -huh, uh -huh. You mean uh, epsilon or uh, eight? No. Eight. Eight steps. Yes. In here, I use eight steps, but for minimization problem, the iterations was more. Oh, got it. Thank you. Okay, I see. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, here also is the schematic of uh, adversarial training. As you can see here, X and T are the inputs. Then we uh, have the attacks, attacks on inputs, uh, and they are the inputs of. Uh, uh, neural network, uh, we obtain, uh, we might we solve a maximization problem to solve the attacks and to obtain the attacks. And then uh, after solving maximization problem, we obtain the parameters of networks uh, to um, uh, obtain the solution of the original problem. I mean, to obtain U, which is the solution. In here, L, uh, LC, LB, and LI are residual loss, boundary loss, and initial loss. Okay. Uh, excuse me, can also, I ask a quick question? Yes, please. This is Panos Tinis from Pacific Northwest. Uh, yes. So this sounds to me like you're doing some kind of mesh refinement, that mm -hmm. basically you're looking for points in space and time where the, the, the loss is larger and you try to you know train the network to account for those mm -hmm. is this a correct way to interpret what you're doing no, actually what i am doing is that uh, i add noise to the um, inputs and uh, we maximize noise i mean we solve maximization problem then after doing that uh, I mean, after obtaining uh, the values of delta, we solve minimization problems. Right, but you maximize the, you, you try to find the delta so yes. that the loss is maximized. So you try to perturb the point in space and time to go to another point where the loss is higher. So in that sense, it's as if you're going to another point where, you know, Ideally, you would like to have more resolution there because the loss is higher. That's 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 the way that I understand because I'm trying to understand what it is that this is doing. How how is this improving? Okay, all right. Yes. Thank you. And also, I think I think that's the right interpretation. You know, even even in physical space or in in uh, the parameter space, that's probably the right interpretation. But I don't know if if she has data to show that. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, okay. Uh, also, we have uh, used uh, Gaussian smoothing and weight decay. Uh, to uh, compare the result. Weight decay is uh, a regularization term that uh, is added to the last function to make last function smoother. Uh, Gaussian smoothing also um, uh, adds a, a small Gaussian random perturbation to uh, each training samples. And uh, in here, we consider uh, the Gaussian samples. Uh, which in here we add the noise to the inputs. 
And then we, uh, we compare the results of uh, Gaussian smoothing with uh, our results to see that which one is better. Also, we indicate, as uh, I said, uh, it used to, um, to um, decrease uh, the um, errors. Uh, I mean, uh, to improve uh, the solutions because uh, it produced uh, the um, stable solutions uh, by keeping uh, the value of weights as small. Uh, yes, here, this is uh, the regularization term uh, with which we add to the last function in uh, weight decay. Okay, in uh, here we um, have uh, considered some example to show the efficiency of this method. At first example, uh, I have considered uh, I have considered uh, KS equation, which is a fourth order nonlinear equation, uh, which is uh, also non-homogeneous. Uh, in here, G is a noun, and also V is equal to uh, 0.5. Uh, the exact solution is uh, um, sine x plus t, and also we have a periodic solution in a space domain. Uh, by using this method, uh, I mean adversarial training, uh, we obtain the solution for five layers and uh, 100 neurons. Uh, also, the number of uh, boundary points and collocation points are 20 and 200. Uh, we have used 10,000 impacts. In uh, this column, you can see the results of PIN when we don't have weight decay. And here is the results of uh, adversarial training when uh, also we don't have weight decay. As you can see here, the results of uh, adversarial training is better than P. Also, after using weight decay, uh, the solution uh, is better. I mean, the accuracy is better for both of uh, pin and adversary. In here also, uh, we have considered the Gaussian nodes, and you can see that the error of uh, adversarial training is better than Gaussian nodes. Uh, hello, uh, Mr. Lugan, I have one question here. So yes. why adding the weight decay the training loss would become smaller. Okay, uh, when we add weight decay, uh, the value of uh, weights keep as small, right? It will uh, it will result in a smaller error because no, with weight uh, decay we have a stable solution, right? Because because weight decay is is the regularization, right? Mm -hmm. It should increase the training loss. Um, when we use weight decay, the value of weights are a small. It will keep a smaller. So uh, the um, error, the train error and test error will decrease, right? Mm. I'm not sure about this. Another issue I see here in some cases, the testing loss is smaller than the training. Uh, in here, we have used a validation uh, sets. Validation sets uh, um, is uh, like, uh, is act like uh, when we use validation sets, uh, we, um, considered the best uh, performance. In that best per performance, we save it, and then we use test uh, sets. So in that uh, iteration, the value of test error was uh, this, was better than today, because we used validation sets. Okay, maybe you can uh, go on. Uh... Okay, can I continue? Yes, please continue. Okay, okay. 
Uh, and here in this uh, figure, you can see uh, the um, results of uh, using uh, adversarial training for KS. This is our approximate solution, and this is the uh, exact solution, which show the um, efficiency of our method. Also in uh, these uh, tables, uh, we have uh, compare, we have uh, shown and the um, converges of our method for different number of neurons and layers, uh, which with increasing the number of neuron and layer, the error errors are decreased. So we can see the um, convergence and also uh, the results of adversarial training is better than uh, PIN um, for different number of neuron and uh, also different number of uh, layers. What are the two numbers, training and testing? Yes, yes. The first line is train error and uh, train loss, and the second line is test. Test errors. So, so this is what Lulu was saying. You, maybe you're doing something funny because it, you show that the testing error is smaller than the training error in many cases. That's not gonna. That's not possible. Okay, I will check it again. But uh, uh, when I checked it, uh, okay, I will check it this again. Okay, in this figure also you can see uh, the loss function of pin and of adversarial training. As you can see here, the loss function of uh, adversarial training is uh, smaller than uh, loss function for uh, pin uh, for, for 20,000 of epochs. Uh, also in this figure, uh, I compared uh, the results of pain and adversarial training for a wider range of uh, uh, interval for X and T. Uh, as you can see here, also for a bigger interval, uh, we, uh, we can see that uh, adversarial training performed better than pain. Uh, in second example, also I have considered SK equation, uh, which is a higher order equation as uh, this equation with this exact solution. And uh, the initial uh, condition is uh, in this form. Uh, for solving this equation, also adversarial training was used. And uh, for different number of neuron and uh, layers. Uh, this table show the results of adversarial training, uh, while uh, this table is the results of uh, PIN for solving that equation. Uh, in here also by increasing the number of uh, neuron and also the number of layers, the error is decreased. Uh, Yes, and uh, the value of errors in uh, adversarial training are smaller than uh, PIN in general. Okay, in this table also, mm, we have used weight decay uh, for solving uh, this problem. Uh, when we have uh, two layer and 20 neuron. Uh, in here also um, by using weight decay, the error is uh, decreased. And uh, for both pain and uh, adversarial training. And in the last column, you can see the results of using uh, Gaussian noise for solving this problem. I think this, uh, Simin, I think you're, you're not talking about the error. This is a square of the error. Yes, yes, yes. 
the norm of our your right. Okay. Yes, but all of them are the mean square error, which is the square of error you are right. And uh, in this table also, uh, I have obtained the results for a uh, high uh, for a wider range of interval for X and T. Uh, both of method uh, works uh, good, but the results of adversarial was better than uh, P. Also in, uh, in these intervals. In here also you can see the results uh, of adversarial training uh, uh, and also the results of PIN uh, for solving uh, SK equation. This is uh, the exact solution. And as you can see here, this is uh, the error of uh, PIN and this one is the error of uh, adversarial training. Uh, in the third example, I have considered high dimensional Allen Cunning equation, which is a nonlinear equation uh, as this form with uh, initial and boundary condition. The exact solution uh, is in this form. And uh, we have solved this equation in different dimension in D equal to one, three, and two. Uh, in uh, these dimensions, uh, as we can see here, uh, the results of adversarial is uh, also better than P uh, for uh, terrain and test error. What's the what dimensionality? Where is the dimensionality? Is it physical or parametric? What is this dimensionality? Uh, what is D? D is the dimension of X, is the dimension of X. X is in RD. In here. Okay, but in all in all the dimensions, the solution is that. I don't understand. Uh, in here uh, we have u x x, and then uh, when the dimension go, uh, I mean uh, when d is bigger, uh, the Laplace term will be changed. Yes, in that case, uh, it might be changed. But for all of them, we compared, uh, I mean, we obtained the solution by using adversarial training. So I'm, I'm curious, what, what makes this high dimensional if it's just X and T? Like you keep the D there, it's just a number of points, collocation points. I'm sorry, you may have said it, but I, I just, I'm not picking it up. And D is the dimension of X mm -hmm. and uh, the dimension of T is here. T is in R and X okay, is so, in R. So in four dimensions, how this would look in four dimensions? Oh, for four dimension in here, we have uh, uh, UX1, X1 plus UX2, X2 plus uh, until u x four x four, right? Okay, I don't know. If that's then what's the ideal solution? Uh, is sine of x one sine of x two or? Excuse me, Simon. You can get the, the reference of this equation from your you you, you you add this question. Just give the reference of that. Yes, yes, uh, I will check it. Yeah. I will yeah. check that's, it that's and then I, yeah. yeah. and then I will tell you. And then I will tell you again. Yes, sure. Also, by the way, so in this Alan Khan here, you use the diffusion coefficient is one. Have you tried a smaller uh, diffusion co coefficient? No, no, I didn't consider a smaller coefficient. Okay, I see. That's a question about the next slide. So the results that you're presenting, do you have statistics for these or is, is this a one-off experiment. You're presenting one scalar number for the loss, and they're pretty similar. 
you know, they're within a factor of two. Like, what, what's the standard deviation on how often the um, adversarial training beats a vanilla pin? Okay, these results uh, are the mean of a five time run. Um, but uh, yes, you are right. I didn't add the uh, standard deviation here. Yes, I should add it here. Can you give us a sense? Is it is it a small standard deviation, like, or does it always be a pin? Sorry, I didn't understand. What what Nat is asking is how stable is the is the result, your adversarial result? If you run five uh -huh. times, you get similar things or not? Uh -huh. uh, yes, the stability was good. Yes. Uh, mm, uh, I mean, um, it changed between 10 to minus three and 10 to minus uh, two uh, for this one, for example. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Oh, but the, also I see from the table, from the first table here, when D go from one to three, go to, go to 10. So, when we go from small dimension, low dimension to high dimension, but the ping, also the PIAT, both training and the testing becomes smaller, which means if you go to high dimension, uh, it becomes easier to solve. Uh, yes, but in high dimension, uh, uh, in here we have used uh, uh, more number, more collocation points. Uh, so maybe that's why the solution is better. Yes, but uh, when uh, I was running this code, uh, this behavior also was what I saw it. Okay. Yes, in this uh, figure, in this table, also, this is the results of uh, uh, PIN and adversarial training for solving uh, Allen Khan and when D is equal to two. And uh, again, you can see the results of PIN and adversarial training where the results of adversarial training is better than PIN. Uh, in this figure also, uh, you can see and the results uh, for uh, pin and adversarial training, and this is the exact solution, and these two are the errors of pin and adversarial training for solving Alakana equation. Oh, sorry, for this figure, in the caption you said this is D is five, then what's the x axis? What's the y axis? Is the first in and the here second we, dimension? We consider we consider uh, the other uh, dimension to be fixed, and the uh, two dimensions uh, are changed. Okay, got it. Yes. Okay. Uh, in uh, here we want we want to. Uh, review some of uh, our results. Uh, we use the adversarial training uh, for solving differential equation and we compare the results with PIN. Also, we use the wave decay and Gaussian smooching uh, for uh, these examples. And the results show that uh, wave decay uh, also produce uh, uh, better results. Uh, it means that it improves the solution, the results of PIN and adversarial training. And uh, also Gaussian smoothing was uh, used uh, to compare the results of uh, adversarial training, adversarial attack and Gaussian. Uh, in here, you can see some of references that uh, I have used uh, in this paper. Uh, 
some references are about uh, pain and some of them are uh, related to adversarial training, which we have used uh, in this paper. Okay, thank you for your attention and uh, feel free to ask your questions. Thank you, Simit. Do we have questions for Simit? Probably everyone has asked you so many questions during the presentation, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, Any, anybody else? Uh, uh, Jogren, you wrote uh, that, that there's another paper on um, uh, adversarial, uh, for, is that for pins? No, 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 just the uh, original adversarial. It's, it's about generating adversarial examples. Yeah, so, Kenzie, uh, Kenzie, Kenzie, um, Kenzie, I forgot his last name, but who works with us, with, uh, with uh, Meya. He has been working on um, adversarial, similar ideas, but he, he generates the adversarial noise differently. Uh, he hasn't published any of that work yet, but uh, that's another group that I know they are working on this. I'm curious if you can share just kind of the intuition for why is it that we want to, is it about regularization? Like you want to avoid overfitting and get a more numerically stable um, approximation? Just, you know, the results aside, just what, what the motivation is for going after this adversarial training. You're asking Simon, right? You're not uh, asking me. Okay. Okay. Yes, wave decay uh, was used uh, uh, as a regularization term uh, for uh, smoothing the last function uh, and also to produce a stable results. Sorry, not, not the weight decay, right? Because the weight decay is just a choice of training. Right. Like, what's the motivation to set up the training for a pin as an adversarial? Uh -huh, uh -huh. Uh, the motivation was to improve the uh, results for pin to be um, robust uh, to, uh, I mean, to uh, inputs with perturbation, to be robust to adversarial examples. Because in adversarial examples, we have a kind of noise in inputs that it's not easy for, uh, for network and to predict it. So uh, when we make a model robust to adversarial attack, uh, it will um, uh, works better because uh, it will learn, um, uh, I mean, uh, that uh, area and then it will works better. But for, so for images, when people talk about adversarial attacks, they're thinking about someone wants to actually exploit a weakness in your image classification system, right? Like someone is gonna trick you into thinking that a, a tank is a school <laughs> for, you know, like th those kinds of things. So for what, what does adversarial mean for a pin? Is it that you just have like maybe noisy data? Uh... Yes, it means the kind of noisy data that is uh, hard to, uh, to predict it. And when we make model robust and to uh, be able to uh, also predict uh, this solution with uh, this perturbation, it will produce good results uh, in general. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Simin. You're welcome. If we don't have any more questions, we can close for today. So thank you everyone for tuning in and have a great weekend ahead.